morning, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And I've known for about a month now that I was going to be preaching. And I had no idea what I was going to preach on. I had contemplated, I had prayed, and I was lost. And then I preached something to the youth. For those of you who don't know, we're going over the life of Christ in a year. Because Christ was brought on this earth not only to die for our sins, but so that we could have a better understanding of God. And so I preached to the youth on this passage. And at the end of it, I was like, okay, that's pretty good. There's more to that. And so I brought a small passage when I was doing the offertory. And I left going, okay, there's still more to it. So we're going to dig deep into it this morning. And before we even read this text, we need to understand how we got to this point. You can read the Bible, you can pull out a passage, you can pull out a chapter, and that, that's fantastic. But unless you understand the context, you're going to miss something. You have to understand how you got to that point. So we're going to look at this. This story is about Mephibosheth. And if I end up mispronouncing that this morning sometime, just, just let it go. But this story is about Mephibosheth, who is the son of Jonathan. Now, who is the son of jo who's Jonathan? Jonathan is the son of Saul, King Saul, the king before David. Now, we all know that Saul was anointed king of Israel. He became selfish. He started doing things for himself. And so God called Samuel to anoint another king. And so he anoints David. Then David being the small little boy, and you all know the story, goes out and kills Goliath, the giant. And Saul at first was glad because the giant was dead, but then he became jealous because everyone talked about David. Everyone praised David. And so he became jealous and worried and paranoid. And so for the whole time in 1 Samuel, we see Saul chasing David. Now, after David kills Goliath, he meets Saul's son, Jonathan. And it says in chapter 18 that Jonathan loved David as much as he loved himself. Now, that, it's safe to say that not only is it a friendship, but it's a, a brotherly love. It's a deep bond. And so we have Saul chasing David around. And eventually, Jonathan gets put in a predicament. He can either help David and betray his father... Or he can stay by his father's side and let David be killed. And Jonathan decides he wants to help David. He sees that Saul is in the wrong. And when he does this, David says, I'm going to remember this. I'm making a promise to you now that your children in the future, I will favor them. And so towards the end of 1 Samuel, Jonathan is killed in battle along with Saul. And Saul actually commits suicide. He takes his own life because he loses hope. He knows it's all over. Now we lead up all to where we're at right now. And the message titled this morning is A Message of Hope. So let's start in 2 Samuel chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul, whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show him the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Now, Mephibosheth, I got it right that time. <laughs> Mephibosheth was crippled. And he was crippled because... He was fleeing the city, and he fell. And his injuries called, caused him to be crippled. Now, in today's time, we, they probably could have fixed it. I don't know. I just know he was crippled. And so, the first point I want to make, and there's three of them, so if you're counting down, ready to go, there's three. The first one is, don't let your problems keep you from having hope. Mephibosheth is a cripple. Life is not grand. As a cripple, you're, you're looked upon as pathetic and worthless and better off dead than alive. You are a nuisance to society. 
Not only does Mephibosheth have that going for him, but he's a relative of Saul. Historically speaking, when a new king would take over a kingdom, they would kill all of that king, former king's family. And they would do that so that way there wouldn't be a civil war, so that someone couldn't say, I have the claim to the throne. So he's lame, and he is a relative of Saul. Now, I think it's safe to say that in that situation, when you're looked upon as pathetic and worthless, and you're afraid that you're going to die, I think it's safe to say that I would lose hope. I think a lot of us could say that. What reason do we have to live if we are a nuisance? What reason do we have to live if someone is trying to kill us? I say that because today there's an increasing problem with suicide. Too many people are losing hope. Why is that? Psychiatrists will tell you, well, they have a bad family life. They got mixed up in some stuff. And that might be true. But the problem is, is that they're not seeking God. We as a nation are starting to lose hope. If you think our nation is in fantastic state, I'm sorry, you're wrong. We are going down. And it's because this nation is no longer focused on seeking God's will. People are starting to lose hope. And the only way we're going to be able to find hope is if we seek God with all of our might. Mephibosheth could have let his problems keep him from what's about to happen. We have no hope in life unless God is in control over our lives. Point blank, end of story, that's it. Society would tell you, well, the good life is going out and partying, living it up, premarital sex, drugs, alcohol. They would tell you all this. And they wonder why we're in such a bad state. Some people say, well, I'm going to miss out on something. I'll become a Christian later down the road. You're missing out by not following God. And so we're going to continue reading in 2 Samuel, starting in verse 4 of chapter 9. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. The first point was, don't let your problems keep you from having hope. And the second point I want to make is, don't let fear keep you from seeking God. Let's look at this situation from Mephibosheth's point of view. He's a cripple. Life's terrible. Everyone hates him. They look on him like you're pathetic, you're worthless. And then he is a relative of Saul, which historically speaking, the king would seek him out and kill him. Now, Mephibosheth doesn't really know David, but he knows Saul. And Saul consistently tried to chase David around. David's life was a wreck at times. He had to live in caves. He was always on the run, always having to look over his shoulder. I have to imagine it was an unpleasant life. And so Mephibosheth probably assumes that, hey, if the king wants me, it's only bad. There's no reason for him to think that it's a good reason. Either something great's going to happen by seeing the king, which is very unlikely, or he's going to die. It is evident that he is a man of no hope. Because if he had hope, if he had a reason to live, he would run. I would. Historically, if I know what's going to happen, more than likely, I would have ran. But because he doesn't flee, we can assume that he's, he's lost hope. He's desperate. There are times in our lives where we run from God. Either it's because we want to have that great and fantastic life that society tells us about, 
or we're scared that God has no use for us. I already made the first point a while ago that society's wrong, and I'm going to stick by it. God has a use for you. If you're here, you're still of use. If he doesn't have use for you, you'd be gone. God loves you. Remember that. Because the world's going to tell you differently. If you've been out there, which you all have, it's rough. And it's only going to get worse. We know this because the Bible says so. But there are times where we run, either because we're scared or we're selfish. But rather than wait for a point of desperation and a point of hopelessness, we should come seeking God before it gets to that point. It is becoming common for us Christians to say, all right, Lord, you are in control of my life. And then we go out and live a life that's pleasing to us. And we get so far out of whack and we get to the point of losing hope and desperation. Then that's when we go back and we pray and say, God, forgive me, take me back. Is God going to take you back? Is he going to still love you? Yes, there's no doubt. But he would rather it not get to that point. See, if we do that and we continue to run and we continue to be selfish, we are being no use to God. Not only are we wasting our time, we're wasting his time. That's far more precious than ours. My dad always told me, if you're going to do something, do it to the best of your ability. That's something that I do to this day, and I try to. I was afraid at that, at that point that if I didn't do the best, my dad was going to come looking for me. That's when you know you have a good dad. But Mephibosheth could have been scared. He could have let fear control his life, and he could have ran, but he doesn't. He has no hope. And so he goes to King David. And so let's continue reading, and we're going to finish the chapter, starting in verse 7. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant? that you should look upon such a dead dog as I. And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded, his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Saul, I'm sorry, David calls Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth comes down scared, rightfully so. And when David talks to him, he says, hey, I have use of you. I'm calling for you. And Mephibosheth says, why? I'm like a dead dog. I'm worthless. I'm trash. Sometimes we get to that point in our lives where we tell ourselves that. Where we tell ourselves that we are no more use. And it's a lie. Because the third point I want to make is through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, we now have hope. Now, where did I get that from? How does that relate to whatever we read? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. A man with no reason to hope, a man of desperation, was blessed with a life that he didn't deserve. Sounds familiar, right? He did nothing to earn it, nothing at all. But because of his father's actions, but because of his father's kindness to David, 
He was blessed beyond belief. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't. We deserve a life of damnation. We deserve to go to hell. If that upsets you, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. But, by Jesus Christ coming to this earth and dying for our sins, we now have hope. We now have a reason to live. There will be times where we will get down in our life. There will be times where we, we feel like we are worthless and trash. And remember that there's a reason to hope. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. Your father died on the cross. Just like Jonathan's actions saved Mephibosheth from a life of desperation and hopelessness, so too did Jesus Christ do for us. We need to realize now before we get to the point of desperation, that we have no control over our lives. We don't. We could try to think that we control the world and that we are the superior beings and that we, we are almighty and powerful, but we're flesh and blood and we can die in an instant. We need to humble ourselves and realize this because by humbling ourselves, we exalt and lift up God for he's worthy. I have to imagine that Mephibosheth was beyond grateful for what his father did. He was probably elated, ecstatic, joyous, because he gets to sit at a king's table like he was his son. When, historically speaking, he should have been killed. And if he wasn't killed, he would have lived his life out in society as pathetic and worthless and trash. That's a rough situation to go through. I told you it was going to be a short message this morning. And I meant it. I could sit up here and continue to talk and continue to preach, but there's really no more I can say other than the fact that God loves you. He does. And the world, like I said, the world is going to tell you differently. The world is going to try to push out God and make it realize that he's going to make it seem like God is not here. He does not exist. They are lying. This nation will continue to go down unless we as a, like a group seek God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. But it's going to take us. It's going to have to take the churches to come together as one to start revival. One person, they can do a lot, but they can't change the world by themselves. We have to help one another. We have to lift each other up. And that's why it's so important for us to come together on Sunday mornings and worship, because the world is evil. The world is cruel. But we're supposed to come together on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights to lift one another up. Some people think, well, church is for those who are lost so that they can become saved. That, that's not true. It's for Christians to come together and to lift one another up and to praise the Almighty God. That's why attendance is so important. God loves you. He really does. If there's one thing that y'all can pull from what I've said every week, whether it's through the offering or through preaching, I usually end up with saying, God loves you. I mean it. He has use for me. I know my life. I know where I came from. And though I'm not the worst person in the world, or I wasn't, it wasn't a perfect past. And we can all say that. But he still has use. There are times where I'll, I'll go through the day and I'll, realize, I'll question myself and go, well, why does God use me? I'm not worthy to be a youth pastor. I'm not worthy to serve in the ministry. And usually, if it's not right then, later in the day, God shows me that you're wrong. He does that quite a bit. He usually ends up telling me I'm wrong. And I take it. 
Because we have to. He controls everything. Let him control your life. So this morning, if you have a decision that needs to be made, now is the time. Don't wait. Don't let fear keep you from seeking God. Don't let your problems keep you from losing hope. Now's the time. Because Mephibosheth could have ran. He could have missed out on the blessing of a lifetime. And this morning, you could do the same. If you don't make that decision, you walk right out the door, you could be running away from a blessing. But that choice is yours. And for some of us here, we committed ourselves to following God, and we let him be Lord over our lives. Yet we've strayed. That's okay. God still loves you. He wants you. Today could be the day to make it right. But it's all up to you. It takes action. Mephibosheth had to get up and go. And so you, you will too.